Uh, welcome everyone. It's wonderful to see so many of you uh, joining us today. My name is Roland Bleicher and I want to start by um, recognizing that we meet on unceded Aboriginal land. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay my respects to their ancestors and descendants. And I also would like to recognize the contribution that First Nations people have made uh, both here in Australia and uh, internationally to both uh, uh, giving us an exceptionally insightful way of looking at the world. Um, and in many ways, that's what we're doing uh, today as well. We are looking at, at alternative ways of looking at the world, at, at, at ways that try to break through existing <laughs> forms of politics. Uh, we're here today to discuss this wonderful book here, Performance, Resistance and Refugees, uh, edited by Susan Diddle, Samit Suleiman and Caroline Wake. Um, and because we only have an hour, I'm going to be um, quite short. Uh, I'd like to first introduce uh, two of the, uh, the editors we have here. Uh, Susan is not able to join us, but Caroline and Samit are here. Um, First, Dr. Caroline um, uh, Wake is Senior Lecturer in Theatre and Performance Studies at UNSW. She looks at the links between theatre, history, and politics. Uh, she's the author of several key articles and books, including Vision, Revisions, uh, Performance Memory, Trauma. She joins us uh, from Sydney. So welcome, uh, Caroline. Thanks then, so much for having me. Then we have with us Dr. Samit Suleiman, who is Senior Lecturer in Migration and Security at Griffith University. Uh, he's in fact currently a visiting fellow at Gothenburg University in Sweden, and um, uh, he's having a lot more colder temperature where he is than we have here in Brisbane at the moment. Uh, he's a, a very innovative scholar working on migration mobility and postcoloniality, and has a very impressive publication track record, including several top journal articles in geopolitics, in the Review of International Studies, and other outlets. So it's wonderful to have the two of you with us today. I'm also very happy and privileged to have two amazing co-hosts with me today. We have uh, Dr. Heloise Weber. She does exceptionally innovative work on questions of inequality, justice, and development. Uh, she has one of the most amazing journal publication track records I'm aware of and uh, two very, very influential books, score of the books, one on development and social change, and one on rethinking uh, the third world. So thanks for joining us, Heloise. Thank you, Roland. And I'm really excited to, to be part of this, this panel. So yeah, congratulations on the book. Thanks. And we also have Cormac Obdebeek Wilson. And those of you who have joined us before uh, know that um, uh, Cormac has been involved in the Visual Politics program uh, for a couple of years now. He has co-hosted several events. He is in the finishing stages of his PhD on protest photography. In fact, just today I filled out the form necessary for his uh, examination. So uh, I want to start uh, uh, with a quote from the book. In fact, a quote from the third editor, from Susan Little. And the quote goes as follows. Um, Refugees are rarely given the opportunity to self-represent on the scale of mass media. Instead, perceptions and knowledge of them are widely produced through standardized visual culture references that portray them alternately as anonymous masses, feminized or degraded victims of criminal elements. And the book in many ways, it's a wonderful book. I incredibly enjoyed uh, reading it. The book in many ways is a fantastic attempt to counter these prevailing stereotypes, to use alternative methods from theater to the video, to other forms of visual culture, to poetry, to kind of break through these stereotypes and offer different ways of looking at who refugees are, what they do, how their voices come out, how they're, how they're visualized. Um, so I want to sort of start by giving uh, Caroline the opportunity to talk a little bit about how the book came about. Uh, it's, it's an unusual book in a sense, you are three, editors, seven authors from very different disciplines. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of how, how you uh, embarked on this project, uh, uh, how, we did, how it started, how you evolved, and, and how it ended up with this wonderful Routledge volume in the end? Sure, thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge I'm on Dark and Jung Country this evening, so um, it's about an hour north of Sydney, if you don't know New South Wales. 
Um, uh, so Suzanne and I know each other um, via theatre and performance studies um, and specifically the Australasian Drama Theatre and Performance Studies Association um, for a long time now. And we share a research interest in what are called theatres of the real. So um, autobiographical performance, verbatim theatre or other types of theatre based on uh, oral history or interviews, um, documentary theatre that's based on archival um, records, tribunal theatre that's based on legal transcripts, um, etc. So one of the major features of theatre of the real in the 21st century has been its engagement with refugees and asylum seekers. And I would argue it actually dates back to um, sort of the post-World War II moment in a way where um, there's another flowering of, well, there's A, a refugee convention and B, a, a flowering of documentary theatre. But um, in the 21st century, I think kind of... Uh, there's a strong engagement with refugees and asylum seekers and conversely one of the major features of refugee related performance has been its heavy reliance on these genres. Um, so it, uh, Suzanne leads a research theme titled Performance of the Real and has done so for um, uh, at, since 2016 at least. Suzanne is listening um, but she's not especially well so um, if you want to correct me in the chat Suzanne you can. Um, but it was in conversation about theatres of the real, uh, its engagement with refugees and asylum seekers and her leadership on performance of the real, um, which is a very interdisciplinary project that involves scholars across um, the University of Otago, which looks at what makes representations of the real or, you know, based on a true story, what makes them so um, compelling and pervasive in, in our time. Um, so it's on ba the basis of those conversations, um, that Performance of the Real hosted a conference in 2016. Um, and on that basis, we thought we had a book. Um, Sue Vandrini Pereira and Nikos Papastigiades gave extraordinary keynotes at that conference. Um, and there were a range of scholars, um, including people who aren't in the final book, but whose work is also amazing, including people like Tanya Kanyas and others. Um, uh, and then inevitably, uh, we, or maybe doubts. <laughs> we had our doubts. Maybe we don't have a book. It's a bit, is it too random? Um, I then went on to edit a special issue of research and drama education with Emma Cox. Um, so we wrote a book. Um, I mean, I edited a, a journal issue specifically on um, envisioning asylum um, in, uh, in theatre and performance. And we were struck by A, the number of abstracts we received but B, uh, the fact that there were very few submissions from Australia, really, surprisingly, given that um, so much of the scholarship in theatre and performance studies had come in the early 2000s in response to the work made um, during the Pacific Solution. So that um, gave me a sense that the gap was still there, that um, Australian case studies and thinkers were still not as visible in the discipline um, as perhaps they might be. Um, and so then we returned to the conversation and Heloise asked how long the, the book took and um, I said an embarrassingly long time. So I, I just double checked my notes and I think the proposal went in in 2020 and we all know what happened, like early 2020, we all know what happened in 2020. Um, uh, various collaborators were coping with floods and fires and pandemic as well. I went on parental leave for a year and returned. Um, so I feel as if we wobbled to the finish line. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, uh, and produced this book um, last year. And um, yeah, that that um, would be the unglamorous kind of story of it, of its coming about. Um, of its interdisciplinarity um, and of its duration. Yeah, do you want to add anything, Samid? Um, <clears throat> thanks, Carolyn, for that unvarnished account. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it has it has been um, uh, uh, a struggle, in I think in a, a positive sense, um, even though it didn't seem so at the time. My own um, entry into this project came uh, through a, a chance encounter with uh, Suzanne at the Performing Mobilities Conference in Melbourne. When was that? Um, oh, yeah. 
20 something, 2016, I think the same year. Um, and Suzanne and I go way back because Suzanne was uh, my theatre history lecturer, my long suffering theatre history lecturer back in drama school at QT. Um, and uh, and so we, we were uh, developed a strong friendship back then and, and had the wonderful opportunity to, re to reconnect. And it was in that context that I, I had the, the chance to meet Carolyn as well. And so we had these sort of formative conversations over those few years and trying to think about how we might sort of put our um, different di disciplinary perspectives together in this project. And that sort of, yeah, as Carolyn says, had its first kind of iteration at the um, performance of the the real conference that that Suzanne convened and we had those wonderful keynotes by Suvendi and Nikos and um and it, it did and I think there were sort of life and and contextual factors that got in the way of things at times but I also think it took a bit of time for us to sort of find some coherence amidst the diversity of contributions um noting that we did have a you know some people subbing out and some people subbing in but sort of thinking about what performance means both politically and also analytically um, in, in response to this question about ref refugee representation. I think that took us some time as editors to sort of feel confident that we had, you know, a, a coherent collection to put forward. Do you have a follow-up question, Heloise, maybe that you want to sort of... Yeah, that's a, a perfect... Uh... Perfect point to uh, follow up on, Sam. So clearly, it's such an interdisciplinary project, and you've got a diversity of disciplines you're working with: authors coming from theatre studies, politics, literary studies, criminology, gender studies, media studies, history, not to mention refugee studies and migration studies. And <laughs> I'd like to maybe if you could share with us the kinds of both the challenges, but also the really interesting methodological innovation um, that came out of this project together. Did the authors have diverse, you know, unique, diverse perspectives? Did they bring certain methodological approaches linked to disciplines or was there a kind of more innovative approach? Um, I'll start with the, the first question. So um, challenges and, and springboarding of what I was just saying before, in in some sense, we had this sort of fundamental um, conceptual differences across disciplines. I'm not saying that there's a barrier to producing what we produce, but um, it was a question of sort of trying to find contact points between the ways that, say, performance studies, you know, ad addresses and deals with questions of performance and performativity in in their discipline compared to. Um, you know, our home base, international relations, security studies, and so forth, which treats questions of performance and, you know, related aesthetic questions in, in very different ways. Um, so uh, and with, you know, notable exceptions that sort of sit in between the two. So I think, you know, th that that was some, you know, a challenge that, you know, wasn't necessarily overcome, but I think was kind of encountered productively. Um, to find those contact points. And, you know, I sat down and read the book again last night um, from cover to cover, and it, it actually, and, and this surprised me, that it, it does, it is a coherent work, um, despite the diversity that, you know, we've, um, that the authors have all come to these these questions of, of that relationship between performance and um, contemporary conditions of refuge and protection and asylum um, and politics in really interesting and thoughtful ways. And it's that diversity, both in terms of disciplinary approaches and methodological perspectives, um, but also in style that really brings something interesting to the, the volume. You know, we go, you know, ranging from, um, you know, my, my chapter, which kind of is, is very much a theoretical engagement with the question of performance and how that relates to the politics of um, migration control. Um, then we have, you know, Carolyn's excellent chapter, which kind of, you know, looks at the onstage um, domains of performance and how that sort of changed in relation to the changing political landscape and media ecologies. Um, and then we have, you know, these beautiful meditations on, um, you know, uh, the ongoing impacts of coloniality and how that links to questions of asylum by Suvendrini Pereira and uh, Maria Giannakopoulos, um, who I think is in the, the audience. And then we have these really incredibly inventive 
um, modes of writing. Um, Anna Zareni's chapter, which I have to say I think is my favourite, um, is is this beautiful engagement with you know breath and embodiment and affect um, in in theatre, but also how that kind of relates to these broader political questions. So it's that diversity that opens up these really interesting spaces that we can find these contact points between disciplines, between theoretic, theoretical perspectives and and methodological um, uh, frameworks in this very broad field of refugee and migration studies. Can I ask a quick follow-up question maybe to Caroline on that? That's that's one of the things that really makes this book so amazing. But can you perhaps a little bit like what Heloise already said, can you ask, tell us a bit more about the problems you encounter and the challenges? Because working off cross disciplines is not always easy. You know, we publish in different journals, we write in a different language, we use different methods. What were some of the big challenges that you faced uh, uh, dealing with people from so many disciplines and how did you kind of get over them? Um, I think it goes to Samit's point of even when you think you have a language in common, so the term the, perf the performative sort of circulates across much of the humanities and, you know, there are a few key theorists who we all cite, but actually people's take on performativity how much performativity they're willing to include in their own writing all varies. Um, and so, you know, there were occasionally, um, you know, for instance, Veronica Teo's chapter is um, highly performative in its form, um, which is um, for some journals in performance studies, not a problem at all. Um, for other more conservative journals in theatre studies, probably more of a problem. And Occasionally for the international studies, I submit was, you know, like, are you sure this is going to read, um, you know? Um, so that's one point. I think another point is actually um, uh, and what constitutes evidence. So actually in theatre and performance studies, because we are dealing with an art form that disappears, that isn't always um, documented or published, um, there's a strong tradition of thick, what we call thick description, which we borrow from anthropologists. Um, and so often early drafts would have long, long um, passages of description, um, which, uh, you know, another set of eyes would say, you need to tighten this, you know, we don't need this. Um, uh, and kind of conversely, theatre and this is and performance studies is more is kind of perfectly happy with the anecdote, um, or take kind of take seriously the anecdote. Given that much theatre history isn't recorded and it's held in rehearsal rooms, the stories we hand down and gossip and um, anecdotes. Actually, theatre um, studies tries to take them quite seriously. Um, you know, the encounter in the foyer or the um, you know, whatever it might be. And again, uh, in some disciplines, that's not of interest. It's not evidence enough. Um, and it, yeah, I could, I could feel occasionally there are different regimes of evidence in different disciplines and they operate implicitly often. And it's not until you're in conversation with other disciplines that, um, yeah, you actually kind of tease them out and, um, go into bat for one standard or another or not or you know decide to compromise them um yeah I I, I would think yeah those are two two difficulties that come to mind the kind of uh when you think you have a vocabulary in common and it turns out you don't which I've had an experience of once before when I had a disagreement with a sociologist and uh, about the what constituted field work um you know I was like oh the field work's done and she's like what are you talking about it's not even started um yeah and then conversely where you know there are going to be differences but actually the yeah the, the kind of the ray the basics of academia the kind of evidencing of argument are actually turn out to be quite different um i've got a, another question for you carol and i don't mean to target you specifically but um since your contribution is in the first part of the book um a main theme in the first part of the book is this tension between dominant narratives and more ethical perspectives. And so you explore this, the part is entitled On Stage, and you explore this through um, the sort of on stage and on screen performance. 
differences about refugee politics. And so I wanted to know um, and hear a bit more about, is there a way to strike a balance between the old and the new, between dominant narratives and ethical perspectives? Or is it always more of a tug of war that is constantly being fought um, no matter what? Um, uh, <laughs> so all of I would note that all of the examples in that first half of the book, um, you know, their video art, their slam poetry, their um, fringe theatre, and um, very rarely are we talking about main stage theatres or even miniseries on television or feature films. So um, uh, on, there's a sense in which scholars have spotted, I think, or, sent, um, or are arguing this book that the more interesting and ethical is work is happening outside um, dominant uh, mediums and genres. Um, so, which is not to say there are not tensions. So, and I'm thinking in particular of a, um, a play that I don't really analyze in this book, but I've analyzed elsewhere called Through the Wire, um, which had huge reach for a play in the sense that it had a, a staging um, in Sydney at the Sydney Festival as a work in progress. It then went on a tour in New South Wales and Victoria uh, and finished at the Sydney Opera House. Um, and one uh, uh, to uh, writing prizes um, but uh, kind of it had that reach precisely because it took a fairly conventional um, uh, approach so it involved um, four refugees telling their story of um, persecution flight and arrival um, it um, had one of those refugees playing themselves playing himself um, and didn't stray too far from what we expect of refugee uh, representation. So I think even though I would, yeah, it, um, I think theatre, because it is a minor form in a way, it's not the dominant form of our time, um, is doing small, interesting, important things on the sidelines. Um, it's nonetheless... Uh, a constant tension in theatre and historical tension in theatre, which is box office. So um, you can create an extraordinary confronting, arresting performance, but um, if it's too much for an audience, uh, you know, it will be, you know, word will get out and you will fold within by the end of the week. Um, so uh, that tension is always, always there and never fully resolved whether you're a government funded theatre or a, you're funding it yourself, et cetera. Yeah, I can see a hand up. But... Maybe Karen? Yeah, yeah but oh, it, it's, in principle, we wanted to keep the questions for the second part, uh, but but yes, Karen, why don't you come in already? And then afterwards, we'll get at all these other questions later on, but we'll have Karen briefly, and then we go to Heloise for the next question. You're muted. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask this of, of both of you, all three of you, and regardless of the bums on seat aspect and the funding aspect, which I get, um, it obviously seems like it's okay for people to speak about their stories, but do theatre makers get, it's obviously not popular then to have a point of view. Uh, have there been experiences in Australia, let's say in the last 10 years, or you said it really kicked off in the 2000s, where people, theatre practitioners have tried to imagine an alternative future or um, have really kind of combated policy rather than just letting people say, you know, I escaped from Somalia and I write, yeah. Um, so the performance that comes to mind for me is called Tribunal by Powerhouse Youth Theatre and um, a collaboration with Griffin Theatre. And Tribunal is a mock truth and reconciliation commission in which asylum seekers testify to an Aboriginal elder in this case, it was Auntie Rhonda Dixon Grosvenor about their treatment at the hands of the state. And so, for the first half of the performance, um, it's Mahdi Mohammadi and Jawad Yakabi mainly testifying to their performance um, or testifying to their experience um, 
as well as um, Paul Dwyer plays various officials and um, Kaz Therese, the um, director, also performs as a human rights lawyer, Joe Tan. Um, and then uh, there comes a moment in the middle of the play when Mahadi describes what it is to live under the code of behaviour, which means that if your neighbour complains to the police that you're playing music too loud, you could potentially have your visa rescinded. If you run a red light, you, you know, um, it potentially jeopardises your, your visa, etc. And Auntie Rhonda replies, yeah, I know what a code of behaviour is. I grew up under the act. And so then the play kind of switches into um, actually testimony from her about her experience of displacement and dispossession um, and about, in a way, being a refugee in her own country um, and what it is to um, lose language and lose home um, via another mechanism. And so that to me is, you know, when the, the country... <laughs> is wondering whether or not a Makarata commission can go ahead. Actually, theatre just goes ahead and stages it, right, or a version of it. Um, and so that, to me, is a moment where theatre is more future-facing and it's rehearsing something um, rather than reenacting something or trying to bring something into being rather than document and record. Yeah, if that helps. Hey, Louise. Thanks, Donald. Um, Sam, I've got two questions for you, but maybe just take whichever one you'd like, or if you'd like to respond to both. Um, um, in specific reference to the second part of the book, how is performance mobilized by scholars as a methodological device and a conceptual tool? The second one is, um, it refers to your chapter uh, specifically. Um, <coughs> And this, in this, you note that people often imagine national borders as lying on a world map. But you discuss the Australian border as, a bo as both a social institution and a continuum. And how does this continuum manifest? And how does performance, the performative, help you think this through? I'm thinking here about Australian border force music a couple of years ago, where they actually said the border was you know, in their mind and they had the right to stop anyone, basically. Thanks, Eloise. Um, some very, very simple questions to answer. Um, so on the, the first the first question, um, th there isn't a uniform uh, engagement with performance um, across that second, other than to say that the chapters um, respond to or engage with the, um, the, the question of performance outside of the the boundaries of, of the the theatrical, I guess, um, that they they all in in their own unique ways um, uh, ask really important questions about performance and performativity, both in terms of the the conceptual resources that we might deploy to make sense of um, the current state of border politics, migration and and asylum politics, and so forth, um, but also certainly. Um, uh engaging with performance uh methodologically i think um veronica's chapter that's in the second part isn't it um veronica's chapter um really uh poses a a, a, a performative eruption into both the disciplinary and discipline modes of of undertaking um political analysis and i think that's really exciting the I think all of the chapters in really interesting ways ask questions about the the sanctioned sites and spaces and voices um, uh, in in migration and border politics, particularly those derived or emanating from from the sovereign state. Um, Nikos's chapter, for example, um, kind of comes at this, I think a little bit obliquely, but quite powerfully nonetheless. Mm -hmm where he's kind of asking um, questions about the ethical fundaments of, of some of these debates around, you know, democracy and um, the, the constitution of, of the political scene, um, to put it in Etienne Balibar's terms. Um, and, then, and then kind of looks to cosmopolitanism as this kind of 
subject of intense debate within political theory, but also as a, a way of recasting um, the our understanding of, of aesthetics and politics, you know, where he looks to cosmologically, or you know, cosmopolitan art as cosmologically engaged, you know, thinking about not questions of universality, but questions of, um, I don't know, I can't remember the, the term he uses, but um of of the universe let's say so it's it's a very different um, way of ordering political thought um and that in, in some ways does engage with performance you know broadly conceived as term in terms of the kind of um uh, aesthetic and um um uh, expressive uh, modalities of, of of engaging in political questions um, with regard to my own chapter, and and, and certainly I reference um, Mike Pizzullo um, or the Mike Pizzullo authored report, which suggests that um, the border is no longer fixed to the, the territorial coordinates of the nation state, but extends both inward and outward in, in time and space. And, you know, aside from the, the, the sheer comedic factor of, of um, Mike Pizzullo Kind of reinventing postmodernism, it's a really interesting kind of shift in 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 the 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 um, the logics underpinning border governance, right? And kind of allows for this sort of conceptual deterritorialization in 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 the way that the border is produced and policed in various sites and spaces. Um, so, you know, in, in the chapter, I, I kind of look at um, or draw on Alison Muntz's work on, on the enforcement archipelago and sort of think about how these border spaces are upheld, not only politically and legislatively, but also through performative registers. Um, and they're not, they sort of go beyond the, 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 um, the, uh, the performativity in, in, in a um, utterative sense, let's say, um, but thinking about the, the wider assemblage of, of, of aesthetic um, arrangements, which recast refugees, we, like we all know that they're there. They're being held in these offshore detention facilities. They're being held in motels in suburban Brisbane and Melbourne. Um, but they're, they're kind of invisibilized in a particular way. Right? And so here performance analytics, particularly this idea of dark matter can help us to rethink the regimes of visibility that uphold these border fictions that are, you know, continually sustained, continuously sustained through both um, the the kind of discursive but also material practices of of border control. Well, when we um, when Heloise Cormac and I prepared um, the interview for today, we sort of came up with a series of questions. Uh, we're not even a quarter through them at the moment, we're, and we're already way past half an hour, which we had allocated for the official, sort of not official, but for the kind of the interview part. So I'd like to sort of move on fairly soon to um, opening up so that other people can, um, can come in as well. But I wanted to sort of maybe ask uh, one quick question, and then Cormac and Joe and Heloise have lots of other questions afterwards. But maybe as a wrap up, perhaps uh, a quick uh, question to Caroline. If if you were to kind of summarize your book just in a few sentences, what what would you say to an outsider is the key takeaway point from the book? What 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 do you want people to take away as the ultimate key contribution of the book? Um, <laughs> it's a difficult question. I <laughs> know. Uh, it is partly because my own chapter documents sort of artists' increasing despair. I think um, that that they are managing to shift or shape anything. Um, but the book more broadly is, um, I think, argues the case for uh, dislodging some of the habits we have in forced migration and refugee studies um, because they're not getting us anywhere in some instances. But actually when we mobilise the performative and in particular when... Um, and this is obviously my own disciplinary background, but when the performative comes to rest on a particular performance, um, we can look at um, suddenly, I think, um, 
uh, issues of embodiment, of social relations, um, emotional and political effects, affects, ideological interpolations, they all become discussable um, because they are for a brief moment held, um, whether it's in a, a piece of video art by Tracy Moffat or whether it's in a play like Manus by Nazanin Sahamizadeh who, you know, wrote to um, uh, refugees held on Manus via WhatsApp. And um, when it's crystallised for a moment and when we bring um, different tools to bear, possibly the discussion shifts uh, because one of the um, sort of famous definitions of performance is it's a mode of repetition with revision. And so if it can be repeated, it can be revised. And if the identity or role of refugee can be stepped into and repeated, it can also be revised. And so too can refugee policies. Um, so look, that probably is a good way to opening up uh, to everyone yeah. present. But maybe first, again, a congratulations on an absolutely wonderful book. Thanks, Caroline and Samit for joining us to talk about it.